Greetings. Thank you so much for joining us today for this wonderful evening of discussion over one of the great literary masterpieces of the 20th century. And that book, of course, is Death Comes for the Archbishop by the great American author, Willa Cather. Cathedral Arts Project is pleased to have collaborated with the Willa Cather Center. Uh, Tracy and Steve, who will be joining me shortly, are going to be uh, giving you expert insight into this book and into the ramifications of the novel for how it has uh, observed and influenced the spread of Spanish colonial culture throughout the American Southwest. I am the director of Cathedral Arts, the Cathedral Arts Project. My name is Christopher Crampy. We are housed out of St. Cecilia Cathedral in Omaha, Nebraska. We're a separate nonprofit organization that specializes in promoting educational outreach with arts events and other discussions that are centered around the concept of cathedral culture. That for us means the ways that the cathedral throughout history has helped shape and has been a part of the shaping of Western culture. So I'm very pleased to turn over the conversation at this point to Steve and Tracy, who are going to be uh, giving us wonderful food for thought this evening. Thank you to both. Steve or Tracy, can you hear us? Bear with us for just a moment, folks, as we get the, okay, we've got the sound now. <laughs> Great, Steve and Tracy, if you could take it away at this point, and uh, we, we'd love to hear the discussion. Great. Uh, well, um, I'm not sure if you introduced me or not, uh, so I'll just introduce myself one more time. Uh, I'm Tracy Tucker. I'm the Education Director and the Archivist here at the National Willa Cather Center in Red Cloud, Nebraska. Um, we're so glad to be here tonight and have a chance to talk with you about Death Comes for the Archbishop. Um, because we're here in Nebraska, this is a book that we don't get to talk about as often as we do some of Cather's Nebraska novels. And so this is a welcome opportunity for us. So thank you again, Chris. Um, I'd like to start out tonight with just a little bit about Cather and then walk you through the broad strokes of the publication of Death Comes for the Archbishop. And in hopes that you have either already read the book or you're still interested in reading the book after our discussion tonight, I'm gonna to try not to give away too much of the action such as it is uh, because Death Comes for the Archbishop, it seems to me, is a rather quiet book that concerns the lives of two priests, Father Latour and Father Vaillant, and, who are trained in their native France as priests before being sent to New Mexico to establish a new diocese there. The book is based on historical figures and touches on the political and cultural upheaval of that time in that country, but it is primarily, I think, about the two priests and their uh, long friendship. But before we talk about all the other topics related to this book, I thought I would just share one of my passages from, uh, one of my favorite passages from Cather's book, um, just so we can have her words here in front of us as we talk about this. So this is a long passage here. In New Mexico, he always awoke a young man not until he rose and began to shave did he realize that he was growing older. His first consciousness was a sense of the light, dry wind blowing in through the windows with the fragrance of hot sun and sagebrush and sweet clover, a wind that made one's body feel light and one's heart cry today, today, like a child's. He had noticed this peculiar quality in the air of new countries vanished after they were tamed by man and made to bear harvests. Parts of Texas and Kansas that he had first known as open range had since been made into rich farming districts and the air had quite lost that lightness, that dry aromatic odor 
the moisture of plowed land, the heaviness of labor and growth and grain bearing utterly destroyed it. One could breathe that only on the bright edges of the world, on the great grass plains or the sagebrush desert. That air would disappear from the whole earth in time, perhaps, but long after his day. He did not know just when it had become so necessary to him, but he had come back to die in exile for the sake of it. Something soft and wild and free, something that whispered to the ear on the pillow, lightened the heart, softly, softly picked the lock, slid the bolts, and released the prisoned spirit of man into the wind, into the blue and gold, into the morning, into the morning. So when we talk about uh, Willa Cather, we always talk about sort of her origin story and how she came to be in Nebraska and a writer of the West. So Cather arrived, oh, Bill, uh, this is where I would go to my first slide here. There we go. Um, she arrived here in Red Cloud in 1883. Uh, she came from Virginia along with her parents and younger siblings, a grandmother, cousins, and a hired girl. The Cathers lived in rural Webster County uh, for about 18 months before they moved into town. And Cather's father opened a farm loan and insurance business here in town and the Cather children started attending school. Though Red Cloud was less settled than Virginia, it had railroads, stores, and doctors, and all the kinds of things that a growing family would want to have available to them. This photo shows a young Willa Cather during her high school years. Uh, it's important, I think, to, to point out to readers of Cather's work that um, it was Cather's uncle George and his wife Frances Cather who came to Webster County when it was truly an unsettled place in 1873 to start their own homestead. And during the intervening decade, more Cathers came to Webster County and the towns grew up and the post offices were established and these little towns started to become real little cities. And so Cather's experience of the frontier uh, is sometimes confused with a much more hard scrabble kind of homesteading experience. And, and um, I think she's very interested in exploring those differences through her fiction. And so I just wanna make that really plain. Okay, next slide. Cather made her first trip to the American Southwest in 1912. Um, her brother Douglas um, was working for the Santa Fe Railroad and that year she visited him in Winslow, Arizona. And in the photo that you see here, they've made a, a trip out to Walnut Canyon, uh, which would inspire a section of Cather's 1915 novel, The Song of the Lark. And during this long visit to the Southwest, she accompanied an acquaintance of Douglas's father Connolly out to some of the missions and pueblos and they explored around Albuquerque and the Grand Canyon and, and different places. And it's worth noting here that um, when Cather explored these places that one of the reasons she really liked them and she wrote about this to friends back east was the, because they were so unspoiled and made the comment that there wasn't a single store at the Grand Canyon. So it's important to, to take away from this experience of her first trip to the Southwest that it felt much wilder to her than Nebraska and piqued her interest in that way. Okay, next slide. But even before Cather ever went to the Southwest, she was interested in exploring the kind of cultural differences that we will see her exploring in uh, death comes for the archbishop. And so those are differences between American and European cultures and American and European styles of religion, um, particularly as they are expressed on the frontier. Um, she made her first trip to Europe in 1902 and Cather scholar John Murphy uh, writes a little bit about that experience in the scholarly edition of Death Comes for the Archbishop. 
He writes, quote, following her 1902 experience of religious cultures in Europe, Cather intensified her criticism of Christianity on the divide, which is Webster County, um, and in Pittsburgh, where she uh, lived for a time, for its failure to be what it could be, and noted the social inclusiveness of the Catholic Church, as well as the revelation of beauty that was to redeem humanity that she saw in Catholic art and architecture when she was in Europe. And she would visit Europe more than once before she ever visited the Southwest. Okay, next slide. How many Cather scholars uh, like John Murphy and um, James Woodruff and others feel that it was inevitable that Cather would write a novel about the Southwest in a letter to Sarah Orne Jewett, who was a friend and a regional author based out of New England, Cather explained that even as far east as Nebraska, there was a lingering influence from the Spanish, from borrowed words and cowboy culture and so on. But it's also um, interesting that Cather grew up hearing a lot of stories about the old Southwest from her father, who had gone there as a young man right before he got married. So in addition to borrow words and things like that, she had some fairly romantic ideas of um, adventurous stories from her father kicking around in her head from a really early age. And uh, Charles Cather had written these in a diary he kept of that trip. And we know that these were important to Cather because not only did she keep hold of this diary throughout her life and pass it down to her niece, but when Death Comes for the Archbishop was published, finally as a novel, uh, she sent a, a, an inscribed copy to her father that mentions um, that she hoped that this would remind him of the old Southwest as it was in your young manhood. So it's part of the family lore at this point. Next slide. So if Cather herself, um, or if Cather scholars seemed sure that she would write a novel about the Southwest, Cather herself seems a little less sure of whether she ever wanted to do that, or at least um, she claimed that she was not sure she wanted to do that. When she wrote to E.K. Brown, uh, she writes, of course, I know that Death Comes for the Archbishop is my best book. I was seven years in getting the material for it, but I never made notes because I did not expect to write a book about the Southwest. It was too big and too various. I shall always remember the late afternoon when I was sitting in a very gravelly, uncomfortable spot up by the Martyr's Cross east of Santa Fe, watching the Sangre de Cristo Mountains color with the sunset. I suddenly, without any questioning, said to myself, the real story of the early Southwest is the story of the missionary priests. They all came from France and came here with a background, cultivated minds and a large vision and noble purpose. Next slide. So she began to research in earnest at that point, and in continuing in her letter to Brown, she writes, from that evening on, I began to find out what I could about those missionary priests. And everything I found out about them made me admire them the more. Even though I made very few notes, um, because the material stayed with me. Cather uh, recalled uh, later seeing Lamy's statue in front of the cathedral in Santa Fe and in an open letter to Commonweal in 1927, she noted that in pictures of Bishop Lamy, uh, one could see, quote, something fearless and fine and very, very well bred, something that spoke of race. What I felt curious about was the daily life of a man in a of such a man in a crude frontier society. So in her research, uh, Cather was able to speak to some people who still remembered Lamy in Santa Fe, but the real breakthrough for her, next slide, came in 1925 while she was staying in Santa Fe. She stumbled across a book by William Joseph Howlett that wasn't too widely read. It was called The Life of the Right Reverend Joseph P. Mosherbuff, 
Howlett uh, was a fellow priest and he had uh, written a biography of Masha Booth's life. Um, Masha Booth had spent a good deal of that time during his uh, priesthood working with Bishop Lummi in Santa Fe and in New Mexico. So in her letter to the common wheel, Cather continues, Howlett's book is an admirable piece of work revealing as much about Father Lamy as about Father Mashbuf, since the two men were so closely associated from early youth. Father Howlett had gone to France and got his information direct from his sister Philomen. She gave him her letters from Father Mashbuf, telling all the little details of his life in New Mexico. Many of the incidents I used were experiences of my own, but in these letters, I learned how experiences very similar to them had affected Father Mashabuf and Father Lamy. Now, a few years later, Cather gave an interview uh, with the San Francisco Chronicle in 1931. And she said then that being a Catholic must be a sort of technique, like being an engineer. And I don't know anything about the life of an engineer and would hesitate to write about that. But when I read Father Mashabov's letters, that very night I had the idea for my story of Death Comes for the Archbishop. Next slide. She continues uh, in that interview talking about how uh, a painting uh, made the first scene of that story for her. And she says, a French painter, Viber, once did a precise piece of work in the manner of his day called The Missionary's Return. It showed a gorgeously furnished room with cardinals in scarlet, sitting at ease with their wine and speaking to them, telling of the hardships and glories of missionary work in some far part of the world. A pioneer priest, his garments dull and worn, but his face all alight. Next slide. There was another um, important painting that figured into her creation of Death Comes for the Archbishop, and this one had to do with the writing technique itself, uh, and that is the Paintings of the Life of St. Genevieve. Uh, when Cather spoke with the Common Wheel, the open letter to the Common Wheel, she wrote, since I first saw the Puvi de Chavon frescoes of the life of St. Genevieve in my student days, I've wished that I could try something a little like that in prose, something without accent, something in the style of legend, which is absolutely the reverse of a dramatic treatment. So Cather, as she writes, Death Comes for the Archbishop, uh, is perhaps intentionally dampening some opportunities to write a more dramatic or more um, suspenseful plot. And she was also uh, not averse to changing some of the historical facts of the two men's lives if it helped to create that type of um, artistic effect that she was after. Uh, James Woodruff, um, who wrote the critical biography of Cather's life, uh, notes, for example, that on the trip to Durango, uh, the fictional Latour travels alone. Although Lamy did not do that, he traveled with guides. And toward the end of the book, uh, after Father Latour dies, uh, he lies in state in his own cathedral, but the, uh, the real person, Bishop Lamy, dies before his cathedral was ever completed. Next slide. And this is where Cather begins to get herself in a, in a little bit of a mess because um, she's dealing with historical figures and she makes some small adjustments to some of them for the sake of the novel. But at other times, um, she identifies real characters by their real names. And um, some modern historians, and many New Mexicans for that matter, dispute the literary treatment of uh, particularly Padre Martinez and some of the other um, Mexican priests in New Mexico. Uh, and they believe that perhaps Cather did actually try to create some drama in the plot by uh, creating a, a villainous portrayal of Padre Martinez from Taos, painting him as a, 
as a rogue priest or perhaps um, embellishing his reputation in that way. Uh, Mary Austin, who is another friend of Cather's uh, and another regionalist author that, from the Southwest, wrote in her book, Earth Horizons, Miss Cather used my house to write in, but she did not tell me what she was doing. When it was finished, I was very much distressed to find that she had given her allegiance to the French blood of the archbishop. She had sympathized with his desire to build a French cathedral in a Spanish town. It was a calamity to the local culture. We have never got over it. Next slide. And Cather was so upset by this criticism of her book, which didn't come out, or the, the Austin's book didn't come out for a few years. And so um, she was upset by it still. And uh, in an effort to maybe sort of refute Mary Austin, began to say that she had not, in fact, written any part of it in Mary Austin's house. But uh, regardless, she did write part of the novel in New Mexico and also part of it in New York and at Jaffrey, New Hampshire, where she often wrote. Um, while she was still writing, uh, negotiations were already ongoing for the serial publication of the novel. And in the end, the Forum published uh, the novel in installments beginning in January of 1927. Cather was still revising the text for the novel even as it was already running in the magazine. And in the scholarly edition of the book, uh, John Murphy notes that $86 and change of the $96, uh, the cost of alterations to the printing plates were charged directly to Cather, which likely indicates that she was making uh, her changes at rather the last possible moment. Of course, the novel went on to receive many glowing reviews and was placed on a number of best of lists over the years. Uh, it's one of Time Magazine's 100 best English language novels from 1923 to 2005. I'm not sure what those dates signify. Uh, it's uh, in Modern Library's list of the 100 best English language novels of the 20th century. And it's the, uh, considered the seventh best Western novel of the 20th century as chosen by Western writers of America. But it still draws a fair amount of criticism based largely around what Mary Austin noted, that Cather's bias toward European culture has shown itself here again. And I say again, because this is another part of the conversation that we have with regard to Cather and her Nebraska novels. So before we open this up to audience questions, and um, I think you have a, a chat box where you can type questions at will, I'd like to invite Steve Shively to join the conversation and talk a little bit more about this um, while we wait for your questions. So Steve, I guess I would say to you, Cather has that reputation as an author who hasn't always been sensitive to issues of displacement. And colonization within her work. Uh, in her Nebraska novels, there's, for example, a notable absence of Native Americans, and in Death Comes for the Archbishop, as we see here with Mary Austin's comments, we, we have some problematic um, issues around colonization. What would you say regarding Cather and her portrayals of people who are not European? It's a big question and applies to not just to Death Counts for the Archbishop, but to um, Cather's Nebraska novels, to her, her novel of Quebec, Shadows on the Rock, certainly her last uh, fully written novel, Safira and the Slave Girl um, in Virginia during slave times. And it's, it's certainly a topic that's more in the air today than it, it was when Cather wrote, but it was still in the air when she wrote. Um, Tracy read a quote earlier uh, from a letter in which Cather says that she was fascinated by the idea of cultivated priests bringing a large vision and a noble purpose to a new land. Well, those are fighting words to some. 
um, implying that the land was new when in fact people have lived there for a long time um, and certainly um, implying that the European churchmen are more cultivated, more noble, more visionary than the native people. The book is full of implications that in matters of art, sexual morality, food, architecture, clothes, and more, the European and especially French ways are an improvement, uh, moving from savage to civilized. Uh, and uh, even when the book came out, um, there were people who objected to this, uh, Mary Austin uh, probably most notor notably, and certainly since the 1970s, um, this white Western sense of superiority has been questioned um, by, by many more people. Um, one of Cather's own responses to this criticism was that it wasn't her fault that the priests were French. And that's true. The real priests were French. The architecture of the cathedral is French. But it's more complicated than that. Cather wrote a historical novel, but it's not history. It contains her interpretations, her manipulations, and her artistic vision. Uh, so maybe I can make three very quick points. Um, one is that Cather was being true to who she was. Uh, she deeply admired European culture, especially French culture. She spent a lot of time in France. She admired French literature and art, the architecture of its churches. Her books are full of opera, certainly a European music form. It's not surprising that the story of French priests in a new land would stimulate her imagination and that she would make the, the, the story larger than it was and indeed would make it art rather than history. Um, a second point is that Cather certainly did exaggerate and idealize her French priests. Um, we can consider her, their names, for example. Um, she replaced Lamy with Latour, uh, which translates the tower, uh, a really symbolic name for the archbishop. And, and no way to confuse it, as, as many people would read Lamy with Lamy um, and the implications that that carries. Uh, and then uh, Mashabouf with Vaillant. And many people read Vaillant as simply Valiant and talk about him as Valiant. And I suspect Cather knew that would happen and, and fully intended it. Um, Tracy's pointed out that Cather makes the bishop a much more solitary hero um, on his own, um, doing everything by himself on a great um, quest, something like um, Odysseus perhaps, or Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, uh, works such as that. Um, the novel indicates that had he retired to France, he would have enjoyed the company of nieces and nephews and by making the decision to stay in New Mexico, he's deprived of that pleasure. Well, in reality, he had two nephews and a niece in New Mexico, uh, and in fact, the mother superior who cares for him on his deathbed was his niece, um, not as solitary as the novel portrays. Um, in addition, there were other French people in New Mexico when he arrived. Um, Descendants of fur trappers, adventurous pioneers seeking wealth had long been there. People like Saren Saint Vrain, Charles Bobien, Captain Bonneville were from all were from Paris or Quebec. Uh, and uh, Lamy knew them, Padre Martinez knew them, and they were a part of the place. But they, they uh, Saint Vrain appears briefly in the novel, but with no indication that he's French other than his name. Um, so uh, those sorts of things are exaggerated and idealized. Um, Lamy has basically no failures. Everything he sets out to accomplish, he accomplishes. Uh, he mentions near his death that he has seen two wrongs 
righted um, and uh, slavery and the treatment of the Navajo, suggesting that um, old, whatever um, bad things had happened had been, and it's his word, they'd been righted. Well, we know that at the time of his death, the treatment of Native Americans and the treatment of former slaves had not been corrected as, as is implied. So Cather certainly does overstate and exaggerate that, that European influence. Um, she also includes damaging stereotypes about Native people. Their culture is dying and there's little blame for the introduction of European diseases and European um, warfare uh, in, in that cultural death. Uh, according to most historians, Cather exaggerated the immor immorality of Padre Martinez and she understated the good that he did. Um, she wasn't completely wrong, but she exaggerated the negative and understated the positive. Um, Indians are almost always boys and childlike um, in the novel. And the best that Native people seem to be able to hope for is to serve the church or the bishops. Uh, think of people like Jacinto, um, seems to have no career, very little life other than guiding the archbishop around. Um, women like Magdalena and Sada, um, their fate is to be horribly mistreated and then rescued and able to be servants. Um, and that's their level of satisfaction. Um, despite this, it may well be that Cather was more sympathetic than many of her time. Um, the bishop recognizes that behind Jacinto, there was a long tradition a story of experience, which no language can translate to him. And there are um, sympathetic portrayals, sympathetic descriptions, um, friendships that seem authentic and real, admiration for uh, individual people that, that, that seems real. So it's a complex um, sort of thing. Cather scholar um, Chuck Pete says that to read Cather is to see her probing the interaction of American myths, of different versions of personhood evolving from the contact zone of old world tradition and new American experience. And that contact zone is fraught with troubles. And that's true uh, in history and in, in Cather's novels. Um, she, uh, Dr. Peek says that Cather moved sometimes easily and sometimes uneasily among all of these different cultures, never quite at home, never quite alien, and finding her energy in the spaces between them. So um, it's a complex topic and well worth uh, discussing, but uh, it's understandable why people would find it a point of, of discussion. Yeah, I, um, you know, as you know, I spend a lot of time uh, and have written several things about Cather's portrayal of Native Americans because, as we as we said, we we talk a lot about the Nebraska novels here in Red Cloud, and um, I'm always taken with the portrayal of Usabio in this novel, which is such a marked difference from how Cather typically has portrayed Native Americans, which is to say, mm -hmm. almost not at all. And for him to actually have um, some thoughts and actions and be portrayed pretty positively, really, is quite a, quite a big step for Cather, I think, in my opinion. And then, um, you know, to read more and, and then and find the the differences between the way Eusebio is portrayed and how um, Padre Martinez and other uh, Mexican characters are portrayed troubles me further still. Like it's sort of a one step forward and another step backward kind of situation. Absolutely, and and there are plenty of other episodes in the novel that that uh, the the Doña Isabella and uh, um, uh, incident, um, for instance, and and Cather really made um, um, 
it makes her almost a, a, a laughing stock, um, uh, a comic figure. Um, but the, with Native people, you can certainly find places where portrayals are positive, places where they're negative, places where they're ambiguous, and the inconsistencies um, are, are very clear. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know if we have any questions yet from the audience or if we should go on. What do we think? So far, we don't have any questions yet. Okay. Well, that. maybe let's um, let's we just plow chatting. ahead. Then. Yeah, we'll just take one I, more actually, question actually, here. I so, have a question real quick. Can okay. I ask? So, I have a, one of my one question I'm interested in seeing. How do you feel? Like, what do you think about the portrayal of um, of Kit Carson? in the book. Do you want to go first, Steve? Okay, sure. Or do you want me to go um, first? <laughs> it's like all, it's like so many of these. It's it's problematic. Um, he's generally positive, but Cather acknowledges his role in the mistreatment of the Navajo. Um, and she calls him uh, she or the archbishop can labels him his misguided friend. Um, misguided is kind of an understated charge for what he did. Um, what he did was to some people criminal, um, mm -hmm. immoral, um, all of, of those sorts of things, but at least there is an acknowledgement that it was wrong and a mistake. Um, she also, um, acknowledges the ways that he, um, respects the culture that he has come into as an outsider. Um, so it's a, a, a another mixed bag, um, as I suspect was reality. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think to be fair, from a from a writerly standpoint, we would also criticize her if he if he was portrayed as a completely bad egg, right? We would. We want a round characterization and we want complicated characters. And, and I feel like she gave us that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. <laughs> we also have to remember, um, Cather wrote an essay on her, her approach to writing called the novel de Mouble, the unfurnished novel. And she argues that, um, the things that she doesn't say in her writing or that any right artist doesn't create um, are present and are there. And uh, a spare style um, suggestion rather than delineation, um, suggestion rather than elaboration is really important to her. And I might complain, for example, that, that some of those pioneer nuns that the archbishop brought in must have had great stories and we don't get them in the novel but i'm still prompted to think about them so cather was successful in that way and had she told more about some of these characters she would have risked her own style and artistic vision yeah i think that's a really great point to, to think about you know, to go back to the Puvi de Chavon frescoes, there are hundreds and hundreds of people in those paintings and everything is glossed with the exception of just a very few things. So, yeah, it's a, the technique was really, a, you know, maybe even on, on this reading through, which I've, you know, read the novel many times, but on this reading through uh, was even more pronounced to me than perhaps ever on an earlier reading. Yeah. Cather has also criticized that the novel doesn't have the form of a traditional novel. Um, and she acknowledged that um, it's episodic. It's a series of episodes that doesn't try to create an entire life. It doesn't try to tell the entire story of settlement. Um, just as those paintings are uh, separate and there are gaps in between them. Uh, and that's true in the novel as well, that there are a lot of gaps. It's episodic. And for her to fill it uh, 
it would have become, um, you know, war and peace. Uh, and that was not her, her style at all. Was it uh, Safira and the Slave Girl where she mentions how many pounds she cut from the book, Steve? Oh, and I don't remember that, yeah. But with, <laughs> with most of her books, she wrote far more. She, she cut far more than, than um, she saved. Mm -hmm. We have a question. Yeah. Great. So, question from, from Judy Kennedy. As a non-Catholic, what do you think made her focus on Catholic priests? I'll maybe start with that one. Um, certainly, this is a religious book, uh, in, in my opinion, and that I think is more than an accident of history, that she was caught up in the historic moment. Um, Cather had a broad knowledge of religion. She experienced religion in many ways. Um, in, and some of that has to do with her reading, her art. She was very knowledgeable of the Bible. Books like Pilgrim's Progress meant um, a great deal to her from childhood when her grandmother would read it to her on to adulthood. She gave uh, her nieces religious gifts, uh, for example. Um, and uh, she was godparent to at least one of them, one, of, one niece. Um, the family... So the Cather family came to Red Cloud, came to Nebraska as Baptists, is what they had been in Virginia. Um, but by 1906 or so, the, the family had pretty well migrated to the Episcopal Church, much more um, a neighbor, a relative of the Roman Catholic Church than the Baptist Church was. And she herself migrated from some pretty strongly anti-religious sentiments which come out in uh, her novel one of ours in the song of the lark uh, for example to a much more positive um, view of religion and it's a more um, liturgical um, catholic um, sense of religion for what it's worth she also had um, significant good friends who were priests both Roman Catholic and Episcopal. Um, the priest in Red, the Catholic priest in Red Cloud, Father Fitzgerald, she consulted, she said, in um, writing um, Death Counts for the Archbishop. Um, the Episcopal priest at the, the time she, uh, she was an adult, but the time she, her family and she by, during visits knew the Episcopal church was uh, John Mallory Bates, who also had a PhD in botany from Yale and so was, was um, a strong, unusual, interesting man. Um, bishop George Beecher, the bishop of, of the missionary uh, diocese of Western Nebraska, was a lifelong friend. He's who confirmed uh, Willa and her parents in the Episcopal Church in Red Cloud um, and was a pioneer bishop. He was Buffalo Bill's bishop, for example. Um, when her brother Douglas died, Willa Cather was living on um, Park Avenue, and she couldn't go back for the funeral, but she wanted to go to a church at the time of the funeral. And she wrote that she to, uh, that um, she couldn't find, you know, none of our churches are open, meaning Episcopal churches, and she found a Catholic church. And she wrote, writes in this letter very positively about the comfort it provided, its beauty, um, at, at that time when she needed that. Um, her time in Edith Lewis, her companion and one of her biographers wrote that she attended Vesper services when they lived in Greenwich Village at the Episcopal Church of the Ascension. And its priest, um, Percy Stickney Grant, was a notoriously um, uh, prominent um, priest and differed, was, was strong. He differed with official church policy in many ways, uh, but the church is very beautiful and she admired its art and its music as well as its priest. So um, she had a lot of associations that I think led her to be open to this story. Um, and then her novel Shadows on the Rock, which comes after Death Comes for the Archbishop, set in Quebec, and again, the, the Catholic Church and its bishop, 
Frontenac were are, are very important figures and, and people she appreciates. Well, Steve, you, you mentioned something interesting there. Um, Cather and, and Edith Lewis commenting on the beauty of the church churches that they visited in New York. And I just go back to John Murphy's comment in the scholarly edition, which makes so much sense to me that the, the type of Catholic art and architecture that she experienced in Europe um, seems to function in a very different sort of way from, uh, I would say, Spartan American churches, like the mm-hmm. you know early Baptist churches or the frontier churches uh, that she would have had some access to in in her uh, in her youth in Nebraska, and how attractive that must have seemed, and if that predisposed her perhaps to being more open to a church that was heavily invested in the other things she was interested in, like art and beauty and language and knowledge. Absolutely. And it's complex. Um, Cather's, as many people's relationship to religion, um, is complex and and shifts and changes. Um, You can look at um, old pioneers where the the French Catholic Church um, is a scene of, of great life and sustenance for the people. And the services are beautiful. Um, and the, the mixture of a confirmation service with the funeral service is, is fascinating. Um, and the presence of the bishop is a big deal. But then you go to her next novel, Song of the Lark. And the main character, uh, Thea Kronberg, is the, the daughter of a Methodist minister. And um, the, the bitter fighting between the Methodists and the Baptists, for example, um, are not sustaining or beautiful at all. And then you go to My Antonia, and the, the church denies Mr. Shimerda a burial in its churchyard. Um, so, and, and, and then you end up in with death counts for the archbishop and shadows on the rock. And it's, it's a, a shifting, growing, maturing, changing um, scene. But Cather was definitely aware that churches could be um, anything but beautiful, anything but life-sustaining. But she also recognized that they could be both of those things. And, and her, her writing portrays both of those, and her life seems to have experienced both of them. Um, she did request, uh, her later years, we have no evidence that she regularly attended church or that when she was ill and hospitalized, um, she sought comfort with a priest or anything like that. But she did in her will specify her desire for an Episcopal burial service um, at Jaffrey and Edith Lewis saw that 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 indeed happened. We have another uh, question here. So the next question is, do you you feel that um, Cather is more critical of native Mexican culture or Spanish colonial influence in the characters, uh, specifically in the the character of Padre Martinez? Uh, An excellent question and really hard to sort out. Um, The original Spanish conquest of Mexico and imposition or establishment of the church was primarily Spanish led. Um, But that had pretty much been died out or the Indians had revolted um, and and driven it out by the time um, her novel opens. Um, So, and and while she alludes to to those periods, um, she she just touches on them and doesn't get into, into, that very much. Um, there is a, a, a very cool moment when um, in Santa Fe, Archbishop Latour has been away and he comes back and he wakes up in the morning and hears the bells ringing. And it's not the kind of bell he um, 
was used here in New Mexico, even though he hadn't been there very long. And indeed, uh, Father Vaillant had had found the, these wonderful silver bells, and they were from Spain. They were Spanish. And uh, they talk about how the silver in Spain had actually come from uh, or been influenced by when the, the, the Moors were uh, a heavy influence in Spain. So that kind of multicultural recognition of beauty, and it's grounded in Spain there, um, is part of the novel. Um, on the other hand, she really doesn't explore it very much. And as near as I can figure out, people like Padre Martinez and Padre Lucero and Vallegas and, and these priests are, are much more native than they are Spanish, even though they are Spanish names, and even though the churches, the parishes, have Spanish names in most cases, rather than Indian, for example. Um, I think she is harsh on what the Indian priests had done to the church. There's a really great article um, that I would recommend to, to anyone who wants to explore this topic further. It's in um, the American Studies Journal, and it's called Borderlands Identities and Borderlands Ideologies in Death Comes for the Archbishop. You can find it online. It's not behind a paywall, but um, it really talks about the different ways that Cather played some of these stereotypes against each other. And one of the things that I really like that this article points out is that there seems to be um, a bit of a double standard when they talk about, uh, when she writes about Father Martinez challenging Latour and, and Father Martinez says, we have a living church here, not a dead arm of the European church. Um, and then goes on to positively portray uh, syncretic religion of the, the indigenous population, for example, um, their inclusion of parrot feathers, you know, and the, the priest at Isleta who is, uh, you know, r raising the parrots so that his parishioners can have parrot feathers, but not being uh, accepting of Padre Martinez and his, um, what he calls the second growth of the Catholic religion in Taos. But I think that article is, it, it has a lot of really smart takes on what Cather has done here. Yeah. Certainly with well, Padre Martinez, she acknowledges some of his, his good qualities, um, but they're really over, she, they're not enough to save him in, in the bishop's um, sense. Right. But Catherine does, you know, there are a few places where she talks about, uh, for example, the, the Native Americans um, who are resistant to having their children baptized, for example. They'll come to services, but they won't baptize their children. Uh, and they're, they're just little slipped in pieces that um, mention how conquistadors came and, you know, wiped out a Native village or you know, tormented them in some way. Um, but you're right, Steve, it's, it's very passing references to what uh, the Spaniards themselves did to the Native Americans there. Another quick question here. Um, what connection do you see between um, beauty and like natural beauty and uh, the beauty of the ritual of Catholicism, you know, as a theme throughout the book. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Tracy. I was just going to say, I think there's a lot there to unpack. Um, one of the things that I noticed on this rereading was how many times uh, passages that I had marked as being particularly lovely because of um, her description of landscape end up being a comparison between uh, the rock formations and a cathedral or a chapel or another um, you know, fixture of the, the Roman Catholic Church. 
And um, I kept thinking of the analogy, uh, you know, the, the analogy of uh, if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything you see is a nail. And it kept occurring to me that uh, Father Latour saw cathedrals everywhere he went, um, even when he was looking at the landscape, even when he was thinking about the native populations, everyone was a parishioner. He really, he was single-minded in that focus, absolutely single-minded in, in doing that work. Yeah, and, and certainly that relationship between um, nature and the church is really strong. Uh, opening scenes of the novel, the cruciform tree, uh, for example, seeing this tree that's shaped like a cross, and indeed it saves, redeems even uh, Father Latour, who is losing his hope, and and uh, um, it, it it's a, a a really positive symbol. Um, uh, there's a scene where where the bishop uh, Cather writes that he noticed the evening star hung above the amber glow amber afterglow so soft so sil so brilliant that she seemed to bathe in her own silver light and characterizing those stars as they're the evening star as female is interesting but the very next sentence is ave maris stella stella um ave maria uh, and and Mary is so important to there's a whole chapter on the month of May and the the flowering that comes and 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 giving that to Mary. Um, there's also a really it's my favorite quote in the novel. Um, Bishop Viant is um, praising the the um, shrine of the Virgin of Guadalupe in Mexico City and how important and meaningful and profound that is. And Archbishop Latour says that to him, the miracles of the church um, are not so much, uh, here it is, um, the miracles of the church seem to me to rest not so much upon faces or voices or healing power coming suddenly near to us from afar off, but upon our perceptions being made finer so that for a moment our eyes can see and our ears can hear what is there about us always. And that in nature, there are miracles. And that's both a religious, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's very much a religious notion. Yeah. I, I marked the passage too about, um, oh gosh, his name's gonna, Manuelito, uh, mm -hmm. who is, hiding from from the government and he's trying to explain to father latour about and the quote is um their country he explained was a part of their religion the two were inseparable um and i i kept thinking about how that is still an ongoing american argument today whether uh, the government has the right to separate Native Americans from their religious homelands or not. Um, it just seems to me a very interesting way of parsing um, Latour's urge to build a cathedral as a separate thing from the land, even though he's searching for the perfect rocks and um, the perfect architecture. It's, it's just such an interesting interplay. I think you could think about it yeah. for a long time. Yeah. And as much as that cathedral fits into the land and the rock is of the of New Mexico, he chose it because it reminds him of Puvi de Chiffon, the palace of the popes in Avignon. Um, so yeah, very much an interplay there. We have another question. <clears throat> um, there it is right there. So, given everything we know of Cather, both personally from her correspondence and artistically in her fiction, do the deficient or exaggerated portrayals of different groups in the novel seem more real? Hmm. I... <laughs> 
I hesitate to say we you might be asking the wrong people because we spend most of our life thinking and talking about Cather. So sometimes the fictional world seems a little more real to me. Um, yeah. yeah, it's really um, hard to this say. This happens with, with um, my Antonia um, a lot. Her the the prototype for for Antonia, her descendants would tell stories that are in the novel that didn't really happen as if they really happened. Uh, and so, yeah, often those things become real. On the other hand, um, there's a strong recognition that Cather was an artist. She was a creative artist of the first order. And to make her art um, real, I think she would have seen as um, demeaning. And she wanted to rise above what was real. Um, she didn't want to go into fantasy. Um, she didn't want to get into abstract things, but she also wanted to be a creative artist. And she trusted her readers to bring imagination to what she wrote. There's, there's a second piece to the question we're getting now, if you look at the screen, Tracy and Stephen, as a snapshot of her own personal position or indeed time, or as an instance of her demonstrably masterful capacity for painting a picture with prose. So uh, we, we can see, you know, we, you're, you're, you're touching on that. You're, you're touching on the, yeah. the questionably suspends yeah. disbelief. So you're, you're touching on that. But if you want to further elaborate a little bit here, that you have the rest of the question. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, you know, there's the there's the old quote about, and I'm I'm going to butcher the quote because I don't have it in front of me, but um, being able to tell better truth with fiction than you can with truth, and I think it speaks to some of the universals that Cather was trying to write about, and you know, she says that in uh, O Pioneers, there are only two or three human stories and they go on repeating themselves over and over as though they'd never been sung. Um, I feel like a lot of her fiction, even when it's starting from a historical point, like with this one, is in fact really trying to just drill down to those two or three human stories that are pretty much universal. And so I, I don't know what you would identify as the two or three stories in this one, person's urge to worship in the way that they felt best, person's urge to, I don't know, uh, be at home in the landscape that they want to be at home in. Uh, those things are always a source of conflict, it seems to me, and Cather explores that in many, many of her books. Cather was, yeah. was criticized a, a fair amount in the 1930s for not writing social realism um, in, in the way of, say, a John Steinbeck um, and others. And um, she um, acknowledged, no, that wasn't what she wanted to do. And she wanted to um, get at um, human truth um, through fiction, through art, um, really. Yeah. We, I have one final question that I'm going to ask of you both. This is from me um, to kind of uh, summarize the entire event. So we've discussed a book that was written a long time ago. And uh, as, we've, as we've touched upon, there are you know, some complexities and as we uh, are how things are in the modern day as, as happens over many decades of development in the society. My question to you is why should people read this book today? So as we, as we encounter these books from the past that, that has some trickiness to them, what is in this book, what is in this novel that absolutely deserves to be heard today just as it did when it was probably considered a more progressive work back in the, you know, back at when it was first written? Yeah. Uh, I wish I knew who to credit this to because I think I got it from someone, but um, that Cather believed it was okay to swerve from the historical record, but not okay to swerve from the human heart. 
and I think she would um, say she wanted to to capture uh, and portray the human heart, which sometimes is very evil. She has some really evil characters, and other times it's noble and heroic, and other times it's very ordinary. And I think that um, is a good reason to continue reading the novel. Is it really portrays um, the human heart and at least uh, a great artist's effort to portray the human heart. And that's something I think we all long for. If, and if it's, even if it's not our own heart, it's a, a human heart we can, can touch. I think that's a great point, Steve. I, I always go back to the, I always go back to the first things of Cather that I read and, and being struck by the beauty of the language and the, the skillfulness of her writing and um, maybe some of the craft and the, the artistry involved in her books. And I, while I, I certainly can't say that there aren't some problematic things that, you know, may, might make me cringe a little bit every once in a while and think, ooh, no, 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 let's not do that. Um, it's worth pushing through those and, and um, pushing back against some of those parts of Cather's work to get to the rest of it that really is uh, beautiful and instructive and timeless, it seems to me. It just, um, yeah. so many of her, her works, is, and I'd say especially my Antonia, we get a lot of um, students who tour and they have had to read my Antonia and the thing that I found about my Antonia is I read it first in my early 20s. I read it again in my late 20s, and I've probably read it a hundred times since then. You will always take something away from Cather that is helpful to you or beautiful to you or um, revelatory to you. And so I think these books have stood the test of time for a hundred years for a really important reason. Um, and if you read it today and it's, it's a book that's not for you, I would, I, as I always challenge those students, I would challenge you to read it again in 10 years and tell me then if the, if the book has something different for you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, and I think, you know, one thing I would add to that too is uh, as the, as Michael pointed out in the question, it, it, her writing has a unique way, I think, of putting paintings in your mind. Um, you know, you, you kind of have a, it's almost a hypnotic thing where you, you, you have mm -hmm. this image and the image stands for so much of the book, you know, maybe 20 or 30 pages is wrapped up into this image that just stays in your mind. And I think as I've read things as I've gotten older too, and as I've continued reading throughout my life, some of her stuff, the image kind of, it, it develops more, <laughs> you know, there, there's more development as you, as you continue to, to read over and over again. But I, I'd like Absolutely. to thank you both so much for, for uh, participating with us today. This is a wonderful discussion, lots of great questions, very interesting. Um, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience for participating. I hope that you all enjoyed it as much as I did. And um, this will be the end of our event. Thank you all very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed it. <laughs>